I trust that you are well and 2022 is serving you with goodness. Welcome to another episode of Help Watch. My name is Sada Hassan and still we're looking back at stories that made it to the show in 2021 and on our first story it's all about left lip and palate. This is a story about a young boy who underwent a life transformation surgery of cleft lip and palate. Take a look. Worldwide, it is estimated that in every three minutes a child with cleft lip or palate is born. In Kenya, the statistics are grim, but on average for every 500 to 700 baths, one child is born with a cleft lip or palate. This means having a split on the upper lip or at the roof of the mouth. On 18th August, we began a journey to Kawangware in Nairobi County to meet Nyang Tet, a 15-year-old boy who has lived with a bilateral cleft lip all his life. This has denied him certain important opportunities in life. Our host, Matthew Pock, is his cousin and guardian. He welcomes us at their home. Hey. <coughs> Nyang ran away from South Sudan with his family when war broke out and since then he has been living in Kakuma refugee camp until recently when he joined his cousin to seek medical attention. He has never stepped into a classroom due to his condition. He only speaks Dinka and shies away from communication because the cleft prevents proper speech. The condition he was in it is for the last 15 years. And you know it is a challenge. And the reason he was he was not going through the through the medication, you know, where we come from in South Sudan, this thing we it is reality. So to get a doctor to to deal with with this condition. Apart from physical challenges like speech, the emotional trauma that comes with living with a bilateral cleft lip is an untold tale. His quest to get his cousin treatment has not been easy. He has knocked on several doors but was turned down due to the financial costs that come with the corrective surgery until he was referred to Gertrude's Children's Hospital. There are no definite causes of cleft lip and palate in children but genetics and environmental factors can contribute to these birth defects. They are environmental factors and they are genetic factors. The genetic factors are the ones one can inherit, but they, it comes as a result of a mixture. Sometimes even if cleft is in a family, children will be born without clefting. So it's not only genetic, but environmental. Some of the environmental factors are like lack of good supplementation for the mother during pregnancy like uh, vitamin supplementation, folic acid, iron, zinc, and many other elements. If they are not well supplemented in pregnancy, they can predispose. Three weeks later, we head back to Kawangware to check on young Ted's progress after the surgery. There is a lot of change since I left the hospital. I now feel better. So, the time the boy was being lied out from the, from the, from the hospital, so I think there's some change, so the boy is changing, but actually he's, he's, he's doing better. So as I talked to him, he's really feeling well, he's okay. He says that some people are yet to believe his new look and he has to keep sending photos to some relatives back in South Sudan and to those in Kakuma. There was some people who were, who were having this kind of condition, so I can tell them that there's a change. There's a place that can at least change them to be better, so that they can be a better people. So that's hope. So I can tell them that we are hoping things could be better. His eating has been progressive from soft foods after the surgery, and now he is able to eat hard foods. Nyang Tet will be joining school in the next academic calendar. The challenges that health workers unions are facing are not unique and whether they emerge from them will determine their future. Health unions have been on the forefront in calling out the government for not heeding and obeying certain agreements. Numerous health workers' strikes have been the consequence of this clamor. 
the vibrancy of these unions is now at stake as the national and county governments have been seen attempting to cripple them by dismissing health workers, not honoring their collective bargaining agreements, and some even rejecting the recognition agreements. The future of unionism in this country must rely on the rule of law and respect for freedom of association, a respect for the collective bargaining agreement and all the agreement entered into by parties, and also to respect the articles of our, our constitution that allows for the right to uh, participate in strike. And for a fact, we never participate in those strikes because we, we, we like them. We normally involve all the avenues available before we resort to a measure of last resort. We don't normally subject ourselves to arbitration, to conciliation, and even to court processes. But the employer normally and almost always uh, disobey and treat us with contempt that it comes with it. The unionists say the frequent strikes normally come after the employer declines implementing their agreements even after negotiations. The push and pull between health unions and county governments is compounded further by the need to negotiate with 47 county employers who want health issues which are county specific to be discussed with the respective counties. These minor issues are county specific and you cannot use county specific issues to call a national strike. Besides the industrial actions, the unions have been angling for the formation of a health service commission by having this agenda as part of the Building Bridges Initiative report BBI. The health workers opine that a constitutional body will manage their issues centrally, even as unions continue to have power and a say on health matters. The health services commission will assume the role of an employer. Mm -hmm. So it will employ, it will transfer, it will deploy, it will allow for training and it will handle all the promotions and the designations. So that still will be the role of the commission. Uh, it's like saying that they'll still do the role but of the 47 county governments. So instead of them being done in 47 different areas, they'll be done in one area. Mm -hmm. The union on this other side will still be there. They'll still agitate for the welfare of the workers. We will still call out for the commission if they don't pay salary on time. We will still call them out if they don't uh, facilitate training. We will still call them out if they don't, uh, you know, uh, give the allowance that is due. So they still, uh, they will hold the role of, of an employer, but from a central point. Those of you who may have uh, been on strike to resume to avoid losing your jobs. Health workers unions say the future of the unions is still bright because the government is better off with vibrant health unions as the vibrancy opens up democratic space to allow workers participation. When you issue a strike notice because every other avenue has failed, the first thing they will do is to run to court and get court injunction. And that's why court must also not be used to side with the employer to frustrate workers. Once they get that court order, they start frustrating you, uh, show cause letters, uh, dismissal letters, stoppage of salaries, stoppage of union deduction, and name it. Things that really goes against the spirit of collective bargaining agreement. Scientists and vaccine developers have been burning the midnight oil to come up with a sustainable solution to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic that continues to ravage most parts of the world following development of new strains of the virus. As much as a number of COVID-19 vaccines have been approved for emergency use, with the recent vaccine to receive the World Health Organization's backing being China-owned Sinopharm vaccine, several other COVID-19 vaccine developments are currently underway to come up with vaccines that can easily be stored and transported. WHO gave emergency use listing to Sinopharm Beijing's COVID-19 vaccine, making it the sixth vaccine to receive WHO validation for safety, efficacy, and quality. This expands the list of vaccines that COVAX can buy and gives countries confidence to expedite their own regulatory approval and to import and administer a vaccine. 
In the United States of America, scientists are working towards developing COVID-19 vaccines that could form part of the next generation of COVID-19 vaccines. The vaccines being developed by the U.S. government labs and companies like Sanofi SA, Altimune Inc. and Greystone Oncology Inc. will come in the form of a pill and nasal spray. Scientists behind this new generation vaccine say they have the potential to provide longer lasting immune responses and can protect one against the new variants and will be a silver bullet in helping fight future pandemics. The vaccine uses a modified version of a harmless virus called adenovirus, which is engineered to carry a genetic code that instructs the body cells to make the spike protein from the coronavirus which in turn induces an immune response, including the production of antibodies in the blood, building a defense against the virus. According to Altimune, the vaccine administered in the form of a nasal spray might induce a type of immune response known as mucosal immunity, which could help clear virus from the respiratory tract, thereby helping reduce virus transmission by vaccinated people. However, how effective is this? And does it employ a similar design like the other injectable COVID-19 vaccines? The current vaccines which are being used are given as injections. Now, where's the difference? Um, with the new COVID-19, um, uh, with the new generation of COVID-19 va vaccines, um, they will provide protection from your throat. Um, so uh, your throat as well as in the blood. So which means if you get, if you acquire COVID-19 virus, um, you will not... Uh, the vaccines will not allow the virus to, you know, cause infection on your throat. You remember, people who have COVID-19 infection normally develop sore throat, and that is because the, the virus starts, you know, destroying the cells of the sore, of your um, throat before it moves to the lungs. Um, so these vaccines will provide protection on along the throat as well as protection in the lungs. So they will actually prevent what we call infection. The current vaccine that we are using um, to protect us from COVID-19 all of them are given as injectables and uh, it, the, the, the way they provide protection is the protection comes from blood to the to the lungs which means they can actually allow covid-19 virus to infect your throat but they protect you now from covid-19 now attacking the lungs and causing uh, damages to the lungs so that is the main the main difference is the main difference between this new generation uh, vaccines for covid-19 um, uh, under the currently used COVID-19 vaccines. They will Vaccine diplomacy is not cooperation. It's actually a geopolitical maneuvering. So it's the clear and clean cooperation that can hel help us to end this pandemic. Meanwhile, WHO advises against the use of antibiotic therapy or prophylaxis for suspected or confirmed moderate COVID-19. The global health body says antibiotics should not be prescribed unless there is clinical suspicion of a bacterial infection. Some of the commonly used treatments for COVID-19 and therapies with emergency use authorization include remdesivir, dexamethasone, among others. COVID-19 has researchers and experts working round the clock to find solutions like vaccines that will either end the pandemic or medicines that will treat those infected by the virus. Thank you for your company and time. And that is where we wrap up Health Watch. See you on the next episode. My name is Saada Hassan. Mm -hmm.